love. And the sermon series is called Love Does. We're not simply looking at what love is as an emotion, as a feeling, as a motive, but we're looking at the action of love because that's what the Christmas story is all about. This is the famous John 3.16, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus saying that God so loved the world that he's filled with this emotion for people whom he created in his image, that he loves them so deeply that he did something. He gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so this, this is the Christmas story. It's about the love of God that acted. And so we're looking at not simply love, but what love does. Thanks, Keith. We've, we've taken the four weeks and just broken down four things that love does from the Christmas story. The first three were actions that we can also emulate, and the fourth, which we're going to look at this morning, is more of the net effect of doing those actions. We, we looked at love goes and about the incarnation, how God came to us. Love always goes out of its own way for the good of other people. Love gives. There's this idea of giving of his son. Jesus' lifestyle is one of generosity and giving of himself and his resources, time, his talent, and treasure. Ours, obviously, different than Jesus, but uh, we're com- compelled to do the same thing. And then last week, we looked at the paradox of love losing, love loses. There's, there's this willingness in love to lay down self for the good of other people. And so we lose a lot when we love. If you're going to love someone, you're going to lose. You're going to lose sleep. You're going to lose arguments. You're going to lose your rights. You're going to lose reputation. There's a lot to lose if you're going to love the way that God has loved us. And today, we're going to close off that paradox with the sermon, Love Wins. So love loses and love wins. And I'm stealing this title. Uh, It's kind of become cliche. Nowhere in the Bible does it say love wins. Does not say, there's there's not a love wins verse. But the scriptures are filled with references to things like victory and conquering and kind of making it to the end. And so there's allusions and illustrations that grab a hold of this idea of of winning. And so this morning we're going to close off this paradox with love wins. And Romans 8 really is the place where we'll be anchored. It's Romans 8, 37 that very closely reaches out to this concept of love winning when it says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And this this idea of love wins, I, I think was made famous, or at least the first time I became aware of this this little saying, this little phrase, was um, several years ago when Rob Bell's book came out entitled Love Wins. Anybody remember this book? It was kind of controversial in evangelicalism. He was, he was asking the question, probing the questions, and rhetorically implying that maybe there isn't a hell. Do you guys remember this? And so it was an uproar. Everybody freaked out. Rob Bell's book. Uh, and like every good evangelical pastor, I didn't read it. I just read reviews of it and, uh, to find out what everybody else thought. Um, and so this morning, we're not, we're not really talking about whether or not hell exists, although that is a topic that is addressed in many churches. I saw this, this uh, marquee in one church uh, that Kyle is going to put up on the screen for you, this marquee from the church that talks about hell, I guess their sermon this Sunday. Do you know what hell is? Come hear our preacher. Maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's what hell is. This is why I don't believe in uh, marquee signage. So... The question remains and can be explored at another time, not this morning, how can God be all good and loving and also send people to hell? That is a a, a difficult question for many people. And one of the attributes of God, though, is his justice. It's part of who we are. We hate to see someone getting, someone run a red light and no one's around to arrest them, right? Exactly. So we love that God is a just God, and so everybody gets what's coming to them. We also love that God is a merciful God, and so when we run the red light, and it was an accident, and we didn't see it, and we were going too fast to stop safely, and we give all ourselves our justification, and then we don't get a ticket. We love mercy, and so these are all parts of who God is. And so we're not going to get into that question today, but we are going to look at God's rescuing us from the impending judgment that all of us deserve. John 3.16 is undivorced from the following verse 17, which says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And this holiday season, this Christmas Sunday, we are exploring the idea of God sending Jesus and his eventual victory 
on our behalf and for us. We're celebrating his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and ascension. And I really just want to convince you of one thing this morning as we look at this idea that love wins. And you could say it simply this way. Love is always costly, but never risky, because in the end, love wins. Love is always costly. To love someone will always cost you something, normally a lot. But love is never risky, because in the end, love wins. Let's just take a look at that sentence briefly. Love is never risky. Now, whenever you look at something that happened in the past, um, even if it was a very tense narrative, you, you tend to lose the element of risk. But can you imagine going back in time and in the present, seeing what God was doing to fulfill all of his promises to his people and a, be a blessing to the whole world? He, God himself, in a mysterious way, expressed himself as the eternal expression of God into a person who was born as a baby. Now, I I don't know about you, but that to me is risky. Um, People talk about high-risk pregnancy. Anybody ever experienced or had a loved one with a high-risk pregnancy? It's very stressful and and scary, isn't it? It's really stressful just to have a baby that's not high-risk. I can remember when our first daughter was born, and I have six siblings, so I'm like, I grew up around babies, very comfortable with babies. When my daughter was born, though, we, she's born healthy, happy, in the hospital, and I remember when we were discharged, they were like, okay, you can go now, and I'm like, what? we can go? What about the doctors and the staff and all the people and all the help, and you're going to send us home with this child, and I, I was just, it took me like 45 minutes to buckle in her car seat. It was like a big deal because you're aware of real, the real-time risk. I mean, I live like walking distance from the hospital. Like you can look out my front lawn, see the hospital. There's my room, there's my house. It took me like 40 minutes to get home. I was driving so carefully and so slowly because we're aware of the associated risk, aren't we? And so when you love someone, you feel a great sense of risk. When you decide you're gonna marry someone, when you say no to every other human being on the planet so that you can say yes to this person, That feels risky, doesn't it? When you decide to bring children into the world, this broken world, and and seek to love them and train them and help them launch into a successful human, that's risky. Doesn't it feel risky? And then you imagine what what God did for us. So take yourself back to this birth. Here you have you have what appears to be great risk as God as God comes and and impregnates a young virgin destroying her reputation with people. The risk of of entrusting the Son of God to to two regular old people. The risk involved in in Joseph. And An angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and says, marry this girl, don't be afraid. But there's a risk involved. Joseph could have been like, forget this, right? There was was risk at every level. How about this this traveling to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecies of old where where Joseph's family was being counted in a census and this long, arduous journey had to be made with Joseph and Mary who's great with child, the scripture says. We don't use that term anymore for obvious reasons. But but here's, here's pregnant Mary making this journey. The whole narrative is filled with risk. You don't, there's no cell phones, there's no, there's no, uh, Travel.com, they get there, hope to find somewhere to stay. They end up in, a, in the barn, essentially, filled with risk and germs and smells. The baby is born there and laid in a manger. Everywhere you look in the Christmas narrative, what you see is the unknown and the risky. And yet, with true love, with real love, with God's love, there's never any risk. And, and I'll tell you why. Risk involves uncertainty and potential loss of investment. Has anyone made any bad investments recently? Don't raise your hand. Have you, ever, have you, have you invested capital or time into something that you didn't know if it was going to work? If it did work, it was going to be big returns. It was risky. See, all risk involves uncertainty and potential loss of investment. But the amazing thing about love is that it does not. It doesn't. There is no uncertainty because in the big picture, the way God who's in control of all things has set up the world to work, every time you invest with love anywhere, 100% of the time, there is a return. You don't always get it immediately, 
But eventually, there will be a return. And that means that whatever it is that you give up, even if it costs you greatly to love, to love your spouse, to love your family, to love your church, to love the world, to love your siblings, wherever you love, every single time you give of yourself at great cost, you will never lose investment on that, ever. And I have to remind myself, Because as a pastor, I'm called to love everybody all the time. Now, all of us are called to love everybody all the time. I just have to look sincere. You see the difference? This was a really, really hard year for me. I'm actually very glad it's over. Did you guys see that video of the kid going down the slide, slamming his head back and forth? And at the end, it said, this was my 2015. That's how I feel. Yeah, basically, dunk, 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 on a pile on the floor. And I'm like, okay, 2016. And I remember people last year, 2014, which was a great year for me, 2014 people said that was their year too. I was like, oh, suck it up, you'll be fine. Now I'm like, oh, I understand, I get it. So this, this has been a, a, very, a very, challenging, very challenging year for me. And I remember thinking about continuing to invest love into people when I wasn't getting an immediate return. And it was very challenging, it was very hard. And at one point, in just an, an the epoch of frustration and discouragement and dejection, I was thinking of one of my favorite films, The Bourne Identity. Anybody seen The Bourne Identity? Yeah, so all the guys can instantly connect. There's this scene where, of course, Jason Bourne goes rogue. He's this, he's this uh, superhuman invested, created by the military, killing machine. He gets a little wire, and forgets everything, and then they decide they have to take him out, so they send all the other ones to come take him out, but he's the best, and so the whole movie is about them trying to kill him and him trying to figure out who they are. And there's this scene where he's being hunted by this other mercenary, right? And he's, he tracks the guy down. He's got a shotgun. It's very violent. And he ends up killing this guy in a field. I know, I'm sorry. You're like, did I come to church for this? But there's this scene where this other mercenary who's gone through the same training program but hasn't forgotten everything, aware of all the sacrifice, all the investment, giving up his old life, whoever he was, going through all this rigorous training and all this physiological adaptation and all these things to do this thing that he thought was so noble and he ends up being shot with a shotgun by his teammate. And he laying there dying, he says, look what they make you give. And there was times this year where I just was sitting on the couch, just done with life, everything, just wanting to be done, and just feeling that, just look what they make you give. And it was, it was really hard. But in that moment, what I was not realizing is that love eventually has a 100 plus percent return on your investment, even if you're getting nothing back in the moment. And the reason for that is because of what God has done for us in the Christmas narrative. The love that God has shown to us in action that has reached us and can be received by anyone simply through faith receiving it. And here's what that does. It makes us a people of the future of the future. Now, I'm not saying from the future. I know some of you are thinking back to the future, time travel, Biff Tanner, coming back to make his younger self feel rich, get rich. Here you go. Here's the almanac of all the winning games, right? We're not people from the future. That's science fiction. But we are people of the future because God has done a certain thing that he promises will have benefits for everyone who makes an investment. First of faith in receiving it and then of love of playing it out. And here's the good news about Christmas. God's love for us, unfathomable, incomprehensible, steady, current, always flowing towards us, relentless love, he pours that into us and then allows that to flow through us. And while on this earth we may not see the kind of return on the investment of love in other people's lives that we would hope to see, although we do benefit some, but the good news is that eventually Jesus, the Christ, will return in person to this place as the judge to set all things right, to repay every single person according to their deeds, and to welcome in those who believed in him and experience eternal life. And in that day, all peoples will receive reward for the love that they showed. You see, we are people of the future, and so we live in light of a day that's coming when all things will be made well and we will receive an invest, a return on our investment. And that's why Christians especially ought to be people who are kind of stupid, joyful all the time despite their circumstances and willing to keep loving people even if they don't love them back. Isn't that amazing? That's who God is toward us. 
and that's who he calls us to be in him. Romans 8, 11 says it this way, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and that's his gift to us when we, when we receive by faith this gift of Jesus, the Holy Spirit moves in, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, there's an inferred then here, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will, notice the future tense of this verb, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so if you're joined with Jesus by faith and the Holy Spirit has moved in, you're just waiting to sprout a new resurrection body and live with God forever, experiencing all the return on all your investment of love. And that's why love is never risky. It's never risky. You, can, you will never, ever, ever risk to love someone. It doesn't matter how unlovable they are. It doesn't matter how close to you or how far away. Every single time you love like God loves with action, there will be a return on that investment. And, and your attitude changes. I have a, a, a close relative who inherited a large sum of money this year in the form of IRAs. Has anyone ever inherited an IRA? I, I got to help this relative, and so I learned a little bit about IRAs. This is someone else's money that they were saving to keep safe, to pull just a little bit out to benefit from, but to live for a long time on. And so this money was all locked up. And so this money was now inherited to a new person. You're like, how would you like to find out you inherited a large sum of money? Anybody sound good? That'd be a nice Christmas present? But it's gonna take you weeks or months of arduous paperwork before that becomes released to you and you have to be careful and think about tax exposure and all this stuff. Well, it's part of the, it's part of the wrap. But I guarantee you, every single one of you, imagine this scenario, you inherit a large sum of money tied up in annuities and IRAs and there's all kinds of paperwork that you have to fill out in order to get that money into your immediate possession. It's gonna make you think a little differently about your small savings account though, isn't it? If you know you have $100,000 in cash coming to you, the $1,400 in your emergency fund suddenly becomes very accessible, doesn't it? You know what? This is going to be a great Christmas. And all you're doing is living in the future. In a certain future, but in the future. And that's what it means to be a Christian. It's, it's to follow Jesus, join with him, living in light of coming blessing. And so it changes our perspective on the things that we have and on the people that we love and on the way that we interact with others. And so we should be convinced that love is never risky. It's always worth it. It is, however, very costly. It is, however, very costly. You see, Christmas is all about the bold and selfless love of God toward mankind and, and celebrating the manner in which that love is seen in those and flows through those in whom he dwells. Think about, think about this for a second. John chapter one, verse 18 says this. No one has ever seen God invisible physically. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side He has made him known. This is a cumbersome Greek construction that's hard for us to get into English. This is speaking of Jesus in the beginning of John's gospel. And what it's saying here is that Jesus is the expression of the invisible God. And so if you've never seen God, you look at Jesus and there he is. You look at what Jesus says, and that's what God says and how God speaks. You look at how Jesus lives, and that's how God lives and how God walks. You see how Jesus feels, and that's how God feels. You see what Jesus does, and that's what God does. Next Sunday, we're going to be starting the Gospel of Mark. We're going to study. We're going to dust off our thinking caps, and we're going to study the Gospel of Mark between next Sunday and Easter It's going to be a fantastic study, and what we are going to experience in that study is a vision of Jesus. We're going to experience who he is and dig into how he acts and how he speaks and how he feels and how he loves and how he relates to people. And Jesus is the perfect expression of God, right? Holy infant, tender and mild. God's love is bold, somewhat reckless because there's no risk in love, and he's expressed himself perfectly in Jesus. Now, I've, I've never interacted with the physical Jesus, but I know him. By, by faith and through his word and by his Holy Spirit, I know Jesus. 
and you can too. But here's the most amazing thing ever. God's still loving the world and putting his attributes on display in people. But it's us. Think about that for a second. The Holy Spirit's job as he indwells us is to both affirm our sonship or daughtership of God and to join us by faith to Christ. And then he pours this love into us, Romans 5, 5. And then he changes the way that we live our lives. We start actually being more like God, loving people. Not perfectly, but more and more and more each day. And this is how God is showing his love to the world. And this love is costly. Let's think about how costly it is for a second. There's this famous section of scripture that talks about love. You probably hear it read at weddings and so on. It's 1 Corinthians 13 and verses 4 to 8 say it this way. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It sounds like most people before they've had their first cup of coffee, doesn't it? That's like all of us anti that. Love is the opposite of that. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And then it goes from this disposition description to what love does. Listen, this is really powerful stuff, verse 7. Love bears all things. Before we move to the next one, think about love bearing all things for just a second. This word literally means to get up underneath of and to hold up. Now stay. And so you're in a bad relationship. God's calling you to love someone that's difficult. That means you get up underneath their burden. That means you strap yourself to their backpack. You prop it up and you stay put. Love bears all things. There's also this other connotation of covering. It's not just a getting under, but it's also a getting over. Sometimes being a shield for a person who's got constant difficulty. Maybe it's, maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's, maybe it's addiction. Loving someone, you're constantly bearing the, the burden that they have created with their bad choices. Love always bears all things. Love believes all things. That's a hard one. That's a hard one for us who are a cynical people because the world around us is a big fat lie i've discovered everything everywhere is advertising and nothing less and it's easy to just believe nothing from anyone and yet love mandates that we take people at their word and believe the best even when we suspect the worst that's that's powerful and difficult love it says hopes all things And we throw the word hope around as though it's something that we would like to happen, but of which we are uncertain. And love, that's not the kind of hope the scriptures speak of. Hope is living in the expectation of a certain thing. And so love is always looking to the future, to what God can do and what God will do, and then acts in the moment despite the opposite, hoping in all things. Love endures all things. This is just about going the distance. It's about not giving up. It's about things getting tough and not splitting and not finding something more comfortable and something easier. Love endures all things and love never ends. After all this whole world is over and all the difficult parts of loving people dissipate, love continues to go on. This is why we're a people of the future. This is why love is never risky and this is why it's worth it to love other people. And to love God, to give God your time, to wake up earlier than your body would like you to so you can spend time in God's word, to make meeting with other people in small groups and on Sunday morning a part of your routine despite the inconvenience, to make spending time with your children at night a priority, to tuck your kids in, to read to them, to say no to hard things and things that you want and things that are demanding, to, to turn work off and to put your cell phone away in order to give someone your attention and your love and your affection and your encouragement. to to walk in a relationship with people that's beyond the surface level. I have a friend, good friend, Steve, and people ask Steve, how you doing? And he says, do you really want to know? Love is costly. It's going to stop you in your tracks. It's going to make you have a conversation you weren't planning on. It's going to make you late. It's going to make you work less hours and probably make less money. It's going to make you very tired. I'm here to attest to that. Love is very costly. 
And love doesn't stop. And so to commit yourself to loving other people is a long-term commitment. There's a scripture verse I read when I first got married, and it's in Peter, I believe, and he says, uh, the man who loves his, his wife loves himself. Anybody ever heard that? The man who loves his wife loves himself. And so I thought about that, and I was newly married, and so it was you know, regular conflict. And I started thinking, I'm going to just love my wife. I think this is a passage telling me that if I love her, that's going to come back around to me in kind of like a marital karma, right? So I start just, I'm just loving her, doting on her, keeping my mouth shut, doing all these things, love, 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 but I'm waiting for it to get better, and it did. Wow, it's amazing. Husbands, let me tell you, if you just put some effort into loving, it's amazing how quickly your wife starts to reciprocate that love. It's great. It's fantastic. But when you're demanding short-term return on your investment, it makes it really hard to stay motivated. <laughs> and so in the moment that that love is not reciprocated, you're like, I did the right thing. Why are you acting this way? And what that reveals is that that's not really love, is it? That's behavior modification for an end in sight. And here's the thing about love. Love doesn't come with any promises in the short term. It demands everything of you. It costs greatly, and it promises promises great return in the future when all things are made new. But in the short term, sometimes it just hurts. Sometimes it just feels risky. Sometimes it just feels like a loss. But it's worth it. And it's not only worth it because of the return that you'll get. I've been appealing to your future self-interest here, but love is also worth it because what happens when people are committed to loving like God and expressing God's attributes like Jesus did on this earth is that the invisible God becomes visible. And do you know what the world needs now? Love, sweet love, right? This Christmas is about what God has done to rescue a loveless world. Because when when human beings turn their back on God, which all of us do, and all of us are born in this broken relationship from God, what we don't realize is that although he is invisible, everything about God is moving towards us in love, because love goes. God's got this, this missionary heart that beats for you. You are like the kid whose picture is in God's wallet. He loves you. He's speaking to you. He's, he's moved in history on your behalf. God is always, although invisible, moving towards you in love. God loves you so greatly, he gives of himself to a degree you will never connect with because God is generous with his love, sacrificial with his love, and he's risking everything for your sake because of his great love. God, in his very nature, is willing to lose everything, even his grasp on Godness, so that he could have you back. That's what Christmas is about. It's about God making good on all his promises so he could sweep up all of his people. There's this great, relentless love that's moving towards all of us. And no one can see it. Do you know that? People in traffic tomorrow can't see it. People at your work, in your neighborhood, the PTA, the chamber, no idea it's there. This world is saturated in the love of God like air. And no one knows it. And here's God's plan for people to see it, to feel it, to become the objects of it. You want to hear what God's plan is? Us. The people of the future who have become the objects of God's great love and allowed it to come into our hearts, to be rescued by God, to have a a relationship with God who came to us, who gave up everything for us, who was willing to lose everything, his rights, his reputation, everything, so that we could be in a right relationship with him and experience his love. It's, It's us who then allow that same love to flow through us to other people, no strings attached. You see, it's very costly, But here's the good news. It's not only costly, it's worth it, and it's not risky because of what's going to happen into the future. Here's the beautiful thing about love. I say love wins. That's the present tense. But love's got 
All the tenses covered. You ready for this? Here's the good news about Christmas. Love has won. Love has won. There's a reason that there's no risk in love, and that's because God has made good on his promises, and it's as sure as the seat you're sitting in. Love has won. And that means that love wins in real time. When you love, there will be an effect. You may not experience a return on it immediately. You may not be able to see it. But every time you choose to love either someone close to you or someone far away, a deposit is made in their heart and they experience something. They feel something. You can't have one-sided love. Love always makes a difference. And so love wins. Love wins today. Love wins at your family Christmas gathering on the 24th that you're nervous about. Love's going to win all these places. Anytime you make an investment of love, there will be a success. There will be a win because love, by its very nature, wins. And love is winning. Love is winning. You see, there's a part of our real life that hasn't seen the goal line yet. I was praying in the lobby with Dorothy for her son this morning, who she loves. She loves him. And he needs God's help. He needs hope. So there's a gap between the, 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 the end zone and where we're at right now. But love is winning. And as we love, we are closing, we are closing in yard by yard towards that goal. And so love is winning. And it's, it's winning and it's guaranteed to win because of what Christ has done. And so we can continue to love without risk but at great cost because love has won. Love is winning and love will win. That's why Paul in Romans 8 says this amazing thing. He says in verse 18, and he's going through excruciating circumstances, persecution, being imprisoned, being opposed, being betrayed, um, physical suffering, losing everything. He's got nothing to his name. People have abandoned him, and here's what he says. For I consider that the suffering of this present age or this present time, they're not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He's like, this, this little suffering? Yeah, you're, you're massively suffering. This is not little suffering. He says, this is nothing. That nothing compared to what's coming. This is the perspective because of his awareness of God's love for him and toward the world through him. And so what this means for us is simply that despite the cost, you can never go wrong with love. That's it. Despite the cost of love, Despite what it might lose you to love someone, what you might have to give up, it's worth it 100% of the time. Never to be discouraged, never to feel like you've been made a fool, never to feel like you've been duped. Your investment of love into people, into God, is worth it 100% of the time. You will never lose. Despite the cost, you can never go wrong with love. And if you commit yourself to that, if you believe that and receive that, you're willing to walk that out, here's the confidence that you have. It's the same confidence that the Apostle Paul is trying to get his people, his readers, the church in Rome to understand in Romans chapter 8. Maybe you've read Romans chapter 8 before. Maybe you've never read the book of Romans at all. But but Paul is trying to convince people like, listen, God loves you so much. Everything you go through is going to work out for your good and for the good of other people. So just keep going. Keep doing the thing. Don't worry about when bad stuff happens. Live as a person of the future. And listen to the way he says it. And he gets rhetorical, which I love because I'm a pastor. Here's what he says. We'll close with this. Romans 8, 28 to 39. He says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, which is to love people and save people. Verse 29. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So he's, he's got you and he's changing you and he's using you. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God's building a family for himself. He's bringing all his lost kids home. Verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. He's speaking. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Speaking of the future in the past tense. It's amazing. And then he says, let's get rhetorical here. You ready for this? Let me ask you some questions. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? If God's on your team, you're going to win. I'm the biggest disappointment ever. I was always taller than everyone. You guys saw Trevor up here? You're like, that kid is not 11. That's a full-grown male on the stage, towering above all of the children, 
That was me growing up, and I was always picked. Oh, you're on my team, and I was the biggest disappointment to everyone and every team ever. Because <laughs> I have absolute zero eye-hand coordination. We would play basketball, nothing, nothing, nothing but rim, over the backboard, right? Was that a pass, or were you trying to shoot? What, what was happening there? I remember playing with some guys, and they were like, listen, your job is rebound. Get to the ball before it comes down and pass it to someone else, preferably nearby. If God is on your team, however, you will never lose. If God is for you, who can be against you? And how do we know this? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Do you see the logic here? He said, he goes on, who, who shall bring charge against God's elect? You're God's person? Who's gonna stand before you in the judgment and say, they didn't love good enough. He says, it's, it's God who justifies. No, 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 God, God, the judge said, good enough. Looks at Christ, grants you his righteousness. So therefore, in 34, who, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died and more than that was raised. He's at the right hand of God and he's interceding for us. Who's gonna condemn you if God's for you? In verse 35, he says, what? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, that ever-flowing, relentless love? We see it in the manger in Bethlehem. We see it nailed to the cross as our substitute. We see it in the ascended Jesus. We see it in the Holy Spirit filling the church, going through anything committed to love. Tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, even death, he says. Verse 36 as it's written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. We're a people who are out there going, we're going to keep loving, doesn't matter if you kill us. Verse 37, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Love wins. Verse 38, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels or rulers or things present or things to come or powers or height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my question for you, going back to Rob Bell, Rob's convinced that God's love will get you eventually. I don't know that it will. I'm not sure. Jerry's out. But here's what I do know, is that if you took God at his word and saw a visible love in people that God was transforming, that love will conquer your heart, I guarantee you. And broke into mine, and I was not paying attention, and I was not looking. I was thinking very small thoughts about a very short life and a very important person and love made its way to my front door and showed me what it really looks like. Love goes. Love gave up a very short life of a very important person so that I could be called a son of God. Love was willing to lose and for my sake did lose when the person Jesus died in my place so that I might live not just in this life but in the life to come and be a person of the future. Love has won for me. And love wins for me. And love is winning on my behalf. And so I want to admonish you. If you're, if you're here this morning and you don't have good feelings about God in your heart, you're not convinced, the whole thing's unclear, I hope that there's just one thing that you're aware of, and that's God's relentless love for you that gave everything so that you might be a conqueror in this life and in the life to come. And if you're here and you're already a disciple of Jesus and you're hoorahing and you're saying, yes, that's true, I wanna challenge you. I wanna challenge you to take your love to the next level, to allow the Holy Spirit who's been given to you, poured into your hearts, the love of God, to start losing and being very costly as you interact with other people in the world. Because that's the church that's gonna change the planet. Can I get an amen? Let's pray.